thanks guys for coming out. Awesome. We're going to have a good day. I don't know if Andrew hit the schedule, but uh, we're going to start when it's around nine o'clock. Our hard stop today is at five. I'm sure we'll get done before that. We'll break for lunch around 12. There's a bathroom behind you. If you need anything, ask me, ask Kevin, ask Andrew. We'll, we'll totally set you up. I know you guys grabbed your little supplement packs there. We'll talk a little bit about the role of supplements and training a little bit later, but that's just something nice Nutrix wanted to donate to you guys um, as part of your experience. So cool. Yeah, I'm so stoked to see you, Cooper. Yeah. I've never met this guy in person, but we've corresponded hundreds of times online. Um, so, Thunderbro. A lot of people kind of have um, misconceptions about like what Thunderbro is or what it's about. I think is it like what like boners and bicep curls? Like what do you guys do? <laughs> yeah, we like to have fun with it. Um, but at Thunderbro, we say our, ta our tag phrase, like Andrew mentioned, is is bridging the gap between performance and aesthetics is um, not only having like a really big, powerful, formidable machine to walk around with, but being able to use it well and express it across a broad spectrum of tasks. A lot of the things we talk about with regard to CrossFit is, is, is kind of merging those things together. Um, and the reason why is like, whether you realize it or not, uh, elite athletes tend to look like elite athletes. There's a connection between performance and aesthetics. And when I say that, what I mean is there's a reason why when you go and you watch the CrossFit games, the, there's a reason why the, the guys and the girls at CrossFit games have big shoulders and quad sweeps and abs and pecs. You know, if you watch baseball, like there's a reason why Mike Trout has like tree trunks for arms, whether it be the demands of their sport or their training that's gifted them that physicality, or maybe their natural physicality has allowed them to express their power and meet the demands of those training. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is that we understand that there's some kind of connection there. And that's where we're going to start, just kind of understanding what that connection is between performance and aesthetics and how those things uh, in interact together. Um, I like to use lots of different examples of that because like if we were to bias one, if we were just to bias performance or just to bias aesthetics, there's, there's uh, benefits and there's drawbacks uh, to both. For instance, um, somebody mentioned the Arnold. Who mentioned the Arnold earlier? Like, you guys bring this stuff from the Arnold? Okay, so Max is like uh, talking about the Arnold Fitness Festival. So if you guys don't know, every year uh, in Columbus, Ohio, Arnold Schwarzenegger puts on this huge fitness festival that's got uh, a lot of different disciplines of, of strength training, strength sport training, bodybuilding, fitness. It's like kind of a smorgasbord of anything and all things that kind of occur within the gym. Um, and the biggest events being like the World's Strongest Man and then the, 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 the bodybuilding show. And when you walk around the Arnold, if you guys have ever been there, even if you haven't been there, you can see this online, you're in a room full of the world's most extreme freaks, I'd call them, right? Like your head spins off your shoulders when you see what some of these people's bodies looks like. These, these guys are just like enormous, their, their, their size, their symmetry, their definition, it's just insane. Um, and, uh, and it really is a place to see kind of like the highest expression of that. Same thing if you were to like watch the Mr. Olympia and some of the people at the Olympia, you're like, Jesus, like who is that guy or who's that girl? Um, and that's really cool, right? But I can tell you um, from firsthand experience or those of you who have been in the bodybuilding community like Anna, like Jason before, is that um, although that physicality is great, a lot of times uh, you end up with athletes that bias aesthetics to the point where they become display models only meaning they look really great, they look amazing, but they can't really do much. Maybe not so much outside of the scope of just hypertrophy training like we're gonna talk about today, or outside the scope of just using like isolation movements. You know, if you were to ask Phil Heath, and you guys know who Phil Heath is? Yeah. He's like the seven time Mr. Olympia. He lives down the street. We get to train with him at Armbrust all the time. And uh, you know, if you were to ask Phil Heath to run a mile, please don't ask Phil Heath to run a mile <laughs> because it's not, gonna, it's not gonna look good. It's not gonna go well for him. In fact, like, you know, there are probably a lot of girls and guys in this room right now who can probably bang out more pull-ups or more push-ups than Phil, maybe power clean even a little bit more th than Phil could because he's taken the aesthetics piece, the hardware to like the most extreme of the extreme. So there's the benefit and, and, and the drawback. Now, if we flip that around um, and at that same event, what's up guys? Um, there's a CrossFit competition at the Arnold. And in this CrossFit competition, it's kind of like a local event. I, I wouldn't even necessarily compare it to like a sanctional, but it's like, you know, some of the better CrossFitters in the city show up to compete and throw down um, and, and put on a little exhibition. And when you look at the CrossFitters, you won't find another population of people that are better at getting the absolute most out of their body. 
You know, they, they are so efficient, they're so smart, they really know how to cheat everything so well that, uh, that they can perform a lot of things well across a broad spectrum of different tasks. They've learned and mastered these different motor patterns to be able to express a lot of power. They have the range of motion. Um, they're, they're very, very good at getting the most bang for their buck out of their machine. However, you know, if you were to look at a CrossFitter in that room, you'd think, average Joe, non-remarkable, right? They look like a, a regular Joe who can just do some pretty cool things. And so therein is kind of like that middle ground we might want to live in. Like maybe we can give the CrossFitters uh, or the functional fitness athletes maybe a little bit more aesthetics or a little bit more hardware to work with. Maybe we can take bodybuilders and make them a little bit more functional or give them a, a broader capacity because I can tell you even bodybuilding, especially at the highest level, isn't a healthy or sustainable type of thing. Um, and I think this is a way we can kind of merge in, in the middle. And to kind of understand how and where we can do that, what I want to do is kind of talk about the differences and overlaps between athletes' hardware and athlete software. You guys ever heard the words hardware and software before? It's kind of used in the tech realm. And like hardware would be like, who here owns a computer? Okay, or a cell phone. Like your hardware is the computer. It's size, it's processing power, it's like the physical machine, right? It's what gives it its potential. And the software are the applications you put inside, the different systems that tell the computer what to do or how to do it to be able to do different things or to be able to do it faster or whatever, whatever it might be. Well, you can say the same thing for athletes. An athlete's hardware is their physical body, right? It's what they have to work with. And their software is how well their brain can communicate with their body. And in CrossFit, we use a lot of different models to describe fitness. One model that we use is the list of the 10 general physical skills. So I'll just quickly like write these up here. I'll give abbreviations. So the 10 general physical skills is a list of like possible or probable adaptations one could have to a training program. And they include things like cardiorespiratory endurance, stamina, strength, flexibility, probably spelled that wrong, power and speed. <laughs> and then coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance. Raise your hand if this list looks or sounds familiar to you. I mean, we talked about it in the level one, right? And it's really just like a guidepost we use to assess like, is our training program giving us uh, all these adaptations? Because we can look at it and we can say, you know, there's nothing on this list that I wouldn't want an athlete to have, or we can, you know, suffer a, a loss of game life or mission if there's a deficiency on here. But if we look at it more from like a scientific, biological uh, adaptation type of standpoint, the top four adaptations here, cardiorespiratory endurance, stamina, strength, and flexibility, we can categorize these as, as predominantly like biological adaptations, meaning there's like a physical change that's taking place in the tissue. I can take a muscle biopsy, I can look at it under a microscope, put you through a, 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 a cycle or a period of training or stress, and then take that same muscle fiber, look at it again, and see some kind of physical change. And those physical changes can look like things like increased mitochondrial density, uh, increased muscle fiber size, increased muscle belly length, but you're changing the hardware, okay? The bottom four, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance, they're predominantly what we could call neurological adaptations, meaning there's not necessarily like a change that's taking place in the tissue, but the change that's taking place is in how well your brain is communicating with your body. And we achieve that through practice. So like who here has ever tried like double unders before or use that as an example, right? Like double unders, it's not that you're strong enough, you don't have enough strength to like jump six inches off the ground or you don't have enough flexibility in your wrist to rotate at 360 degrees. It's the fact that, you know, your brain can't communicate with your body to flip your wrist twice every time you jump. So you sit there and you struggle and you, and you, and you practice, okay? Uh, the middle two, power and speed, they're influenced by both, right? So I can make you more powerful or faster by increasing your hardware, just making you a more formidable machine, or I can teach you how to use what you have a little bit more efficiently, okay? So the point with this is, with Thunder Road, with our training programs, with our methodology, we bias the biological adaptations a little bit more. That's what we focus on. Uh, you know, you guys get to train really athletic patterns, different capacities in CrossFit all the time. You do tons of skill work there. That's great. Continue to do that. But there's a way for us to have a large influence on your fitness by just working on these physical pieces. And the way that we do that in Thunderbro is through a process called hypertrophy. So now 
we get to dive into the science. Are you guys good? Do you guys need a seat? Grab no, right here, front seat, right here. I got you right here. I'm gonna make you stare at me. Yeah. Guys, this is Kayla and Tyler. Tyler's a short one. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so um, this is where we dive into science. Thank you, Nate. He drew the diagrams we're gonna look at. Um, this, this review of science is a very remedial, basic kind of overlap. If any of you guys have been through any anatomy physiology courses, uh, you'll notice that this is, this is quite a, a very simple uh, look at things, but it's really important that we understand the processes we're, we're gonna talk about. Um, you know, in, in CrossFit, who's ever heard of this, uh, this phrase called the black box theory? Have you guys ever heard of that before? I know Kevin, okay, so this is the black box theory, right? And this came straight out of our owner and founder coach, Greg Glassman's mouth. He said, okay, we got, a, we got a series of stressors, like the things we ask you to do in the gym. Those are the inputs. And they go into this black box. The black box is your body. We can't see inside. We don't really know exactly what's going on, but we know that the adaptation we get is you run faster, you lift more, you get healthier, right? You have increased insulin sensitivity and lower body fat. I ask you to do burpees and thrusters, you're leaner and, and you're stronger. And the idea is like, well, what happens in the middle doesn't really matter, okay? Well, my personal opinion on that is, while I agree with a lot of things Greg says, I don't agree with that. Okay, I think it does matter that you know what's, go what's going on inside because if you understand the mechanisms that are going on inside, then you can more accurately target them in your training. So understanding the macro allows you to get better perspective of the, uh, or understanding the micro under under gives you better perspective of the, of, of the macro. So hypertrophy. Hypertrophy describes one way that cells can adapt to stress. This type of stress can include things like inflammation, hormonal stimulation, or an increased workload. When a cell increases in its size beyond its normal size, it's gone through hypertrophy. So if I look at a cell, just give you a little diagram here. Oh shit, it's bigger. It's gone through hypertrophy. There's lots of different things. You see why Nate Strong's are way better. Um, there's lots of different types of hypertrophy that can occur in the body, right? So there are favorable and unfavorable types of hypertrophy. Probably the reason why you guys are here is because you're looking for a favorable type of hypertrophy called muscle hypertrophy. But then there are things like cardiac hypertrophy, hypertrophy in your internal organs, you don't want that stuff. So for the sake of what we're talking about today, we're going to refer to muscle hypertrophy. Now at a cellular level, and this is very general, not even specific to muscle fibers, when a cell goes through hypertrophy, you notice lots of different changes that occur within the cell. Um, so to keep this really simple, I don't want to confuse you with too many words, organelles are the cell's internal machinery. It's the things that, that are inside the cell. And we're gonna keep it really basic, just talk about three, three main things. Mitochondria in cells, you can think of them as the cell's internal power generator. They're, they're what the cell uh, allows the cell to do work. So when cells go through muscle hypertrophy, we see things like an increased density of mitochondria, say, to accommodate to an increased workload. I ask you to do more, and at a cellular level, you're getting more mitochondria in each cell to kind of accommodate to that stress. The endoplasmic reticulum, that's a big word, right? You can think of it as, I'll just draw a little, this is kind of what it looks like here. It's like this little squiggly thing. It's the cell's internal processor. It makes the stuff inside the cell. It gives it different nutrients, kind of processes things through to allow the cell to grow. The endoplasmic reticulum will get bigger to accommodate to the increased amount of stuff we're, we're, we're making in the cell. And the plasma even, which is the fluid inside the cell, starts to increase. And the plasma is primarily cons uh, constrived of proteins, or in the case of muscle fibers, it's even got some glycogen inside. Now, if we look at a muscle fiber, and this is where it starts to like kind of sound cool. Muscle hypertrophy can be seen as like a thickening or a bulkening of muscle fibers. So if I take a muscle belly right here and I slice it right in half, where you can see all the stuff that's inside, on the very outside of the muscle, you'll notice kind of an outer membrane called the epimecium. Okay, so the epimecium is kind of like this membrane sheet that covers all muscles. It's a very slick, kind of a covering that allows it to avoid friction with other muscles or other bones. It also starts to collect and consolidate at the ends of muscles to create, among other things, tendons that will connect muscle to bone. Okay, so that's the outer sheet that covers muscles. Now, if you take a slice through the muscle, you'll notice all these little circles here 
which we can call fasciculi. Okay? And the fasciculi are made of bundles of muscle fibers. So in a single muscle fascicle, if we're just looking at this one, you can see anywhere from 10 to 100 muscle fibers in each fasciculi, depending on the size of the muscle. Like a large muscle like your quad will contain a lot of muscle fibers. Uh, a smaller muscle that requires more precision and dexterity like your hands has, has a little bit less of those, okay? And in the fasciculi, you'll see all of these, we're just pulling out a muscle fiber here, all of these individual muscle fibers that are bo bonded by a fibrous connective tissue called the paramecium. So that's the glue that's kind of holding all of those muscle fibers kind of together with each other. And if you pull out a single muscle fiber, on the outside of a muscle fiber, you're gonna see the endomecium which is kind of this uh, fibrous insulating layer that just protects each individual muscle fiber. And then beneath the endomecium, you end up with, okay, so endomecium, we'll get into that. So, sarcolemma. All right, so now we're really deep into the muscle fiber. The sarcolemma is the uh, kind of the membrane that is surrounding the individual fiber. It allows nutrients in and out. It's kind of this uh, outer membrane sheath that will cover each one of those muscle fibers. Now, if you look inside the fiber, this is where it gets really interesting. The fiber is composed of myofibrils. And the myofibrils are made of myofilaments, which are the bonds between two different types of protein, myosin protein, an actin protein, okay? Uh, and these, myo, uh, these myofibrils are really important because they're actually what allow muscles to contract. So now we've kind of looked from the very largest structure, like we're looking from the outside and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We took it through the muscle to the, fat, to, to the fasciculi, then we pulled out a single fasciculi and looked at the muscle fiber, then we looked at the anatomy of the single fiber. Now we're actually looking at the proteins inside the, the, the fiber. And surrounding these, these, uh, these proteins is a fluid. And the fluid is called sarcoplasm. So that sarcoplasm is kind of like this gelatinous fluid that these uh, myofibrils are bathing in that contain things like um, glycosomes, basically muscle glycogen, uh, myoglobin, different proteins, even different fats to, to allow it to energy to, to create the conversions that are going to let it contract. So now if we look at actually this, this myosin and actin individual unit, this is a picture here of what we call a sarcomere. Keep writing it backwards. So a sarcomere is the smallest contractile unit in a muscle fiber that we can actually look at and measure and see what's going on. And here it's a, it's, it's a visual, it probably does looks nothing like this in reality. This is just kind of like a diagram because in reality it just looks like a bunch of squiggly proteins kind of fucking each other. Um, so, uh, so what we've got here is the smallest contractile unit with two different types of protein. And the proteins contain large filaments that we call actin filaments. So the blue here are actin proteins. And the thicker filaments, which are red, are the myosin proteins. So when you look at this kind of like under a microscope, and this is really interesting, the thick myosin filaments, they kind of look like uh, almost like an olive branch, if you will. Like it's this long kind of twiny thing with all these nubs sticking out, but it's a lot thicker. And the actin is like a helix. It's a little bit thinner and just kind of goes around itself. And what happens is those two things, they connect with each other. The best way I can make an analogy here is like with a piece of Velcro. If you guys ever looked really closely at Velcro, you see all these little hooks that kind of connect with each other. Well, that's essentially what's happening with the protein. And this unit of measurement, a sarcomere, just goes from the beginning of one actin filament to the end of the next, separated by something that we call a Z-disc. 
which is a, 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 and termed as like a Z line. So it's kind of one unit from one my, uh, active filament to the end of the next one. And then this is the most smallest individual contractile unit. Okay. Now that's a lot of stuff in there. Here's what's important to understand. When we go through muscle hypertrophy, there are a lot of adaptations that occur at the muscle fiber level and even at this contractile unit level that are going to influence the adaptations we want. So let's say I put you through a period of stress. The adaptations you'll see here first start on the outside of the muscle fiber at the sarcolemma. And at the sarcolemma, which again is that outer membrane, you create large tears in the sarcolemma when you go through intense training. We're gonna talk about what type of training we're talking about specifically, but those large tears in the sarcolemma, they actually start to heal, remodel, and remodel thicker, which gives the muscle fiber an increased bulk, okay? So there's primarily a really big one we look at when we're talking about like the muscle damage you do in the gym is you get large tears in the sarcolemma. Now, even at a very microscopic level, when we look at the myofibril or the myofilaments, we see damages that occur to these myosin and actin bonds. And those damages cause a response where we end up with an increased amount and thickness of myosin and actin bonds. So if you look at those, uh, you see these like little hooks, I guess we're drawing here, connecting together, those get damaged, they heal, but they remodel thicker and more numerous. So now let's think back to like the Velcro, right? Imagine a piece of Velcro, but now you've got more of those little hooks and those little hooks are thicker. That allows them to be stronger. So when we say things like, hey, why do bigger and stronger often go together? Why are they usually synonymous with each other? It's because you're able to achieve an increased contractile potential because those myosin and actin bonds are stronger. They allow the muscle to actually contract with more force. Now, whether you're able to potentiate that force or not is kind of dependent on how your neurological things are working, but bigger gives you more potential, okay? More potential to, to express more power. That's why you don't see the small guys bench pressing 600 pounds. Usually it's like the bigger guys, okay? All right, cool. So that's the science there. Now, let's get away from this because this was actually like, I don't, want, I don't want you guys to shoot yourself or anything because <laughs> this is a lot of fun stuff. I like to geek out on it. Um, in fact, we had a really cool podcast the other day with one of the uh, world's foremost experts on muscle hypertrophy, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, who kind of works in the university setting, and like he could take any one of those elements we talked about and probably go for hours and talk about like the different enzymatic interactions of protein that allow the, the myosin and actin to contract. It's actually such a really cool, complex process that, that muscles contract in where it starts with an electrical signal in your brain, then it converts to a chemical signal in the muscle and then back to an electrical signal that shorten those myosin and actin bonds where the myosin is actually pulling the actin closer together, which over the course of hundreds and thousands of units makes that whole muscle contract, okay? So now let's talk about the good stuff that you guys wanna know about, which are the mechanisms that drive muscle hypertrophy. So remember we were giving you that black box analogy? Well, this is us actually looking in the black box. This is us coming up with the best guess based on the current science of what is actually gonna garner or elicit a muscle to grow. And a lot of the information we're, we're presenting here comes from various studies, but a lot of it has also been consolidated and, and put together by that guy we were just talking about, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, who wrote a great book on hypertrophy called The Science of Muscle Hypertrophy. And in this book, it's like this huge textbook. He highlights three major principles that we can look to that often are present when muscles grow. And all of them usually occur simultaneously with each other, so they're not synonymous to themselves. Sometimes they can detract or, 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 uh, or take away from, it, from another mechanism. And some may be a little bit more potent than others, but we're gonna talk about all of them nonetheless. The first one we're gonna talk about is muscle tension. Okay. So, probably have a guess of what like, muscle tension means. You're like, oh, who's ever heard the word like peak tension before? Right? Squeeze it as hard as you can. Uh, muscle tension refers to the specific type of mechanical loading you're putting on a muscle with regard to magnitude, frequency,
and duration. So, okay, <laughs> bro science meets real science here for a second, okay? Magnitude, how, how hard, how much load is going through the muscle, okay? Frequency, how often are you loading it? Duration, how long does it stay under tension, okay? And all of these have a lot of influence on creating that hypertrophic response. Um, of all three mechanisms we're gonna talk about, Dr. Schoenfeld said this is the one that he's probably most confident in. He's like, I don't know, these other ones are usually associated with muscle growth, but this one is always associated with, mu with, with muscle growth. And to understand what's actually happening at like the muscle fiber level to be able to achieve mu you know, the right amount of muscle tension, you have to understand that muscles are very, very smart. They're very intuitive. Um, and it's interesting because I'm sure that you guys have heard terms before like muscle confusion. Have you ever heard that before? Like the, the P90X guy says it, like muscle confusion. And I remember watching, uh, I think in Pumping Iron, right? Uh, Arnold was talking about how he alternates his routine. He's like, you need to keep the muscle guessing. Just when you think you're getting used to it, I destroy you, right? Um, so. The reason for that, like the science behind that, is that muscles contain mechanosensors. They're tiny little sensors that are able to communicate very quickly with the brain to say, hey, how heavy is this load? What's the range of motion? What's the plane of movement? Okay. And if you expose yourself to a different type of stressor, you end up getting a pretty good training response. Now, there is like a reasonable context in there. Like, I'm not going to hit you with a car and then go ask you to train. That's different. But I'm talking about something like progressive overload, uh, exchanging different movements, all, all different types of training factors you can modulate to be able to get the mechanosensors to freak out a little bit, to get an exposure to what they're not used to. And this plays on a really basic concept in science called the general adaptation syndrome. So the general adaptation syndrome is this theory by this old dude back in the 1800s, Hans Seal. And he goes and he's observing all these different animals and he comes up with this concept like, you know, organisms tend to adapt to the stress that, that are placed upon them. Meaning, you know, let me see, Jason, right? Jason's pretty, pretty white looking guy. If I take Jason and I put him out in the sun, what happens to Jason? He gets tan, right? Probably burned, then tan, right? But there's an adaptation that takes place. If I say, uh, who, here, who here's a pretty, pretty hefty guy? So let's take Tyler here for a second, right? Tyler's a nice big dude. If I say, hey, Tyler, you're gonna spend uh, the next couple of weeks running marathons. What's gonna happen to Tyler's body? The weight's gonna fall <laughs> off of him. Yeah, because the one common, the one common theme that your body will always try to do is survive. Right? That's what it'll try to do. Like, your body doesn't care if it's big or small, it doesn't care if it looks good in a bikini, it wants to survive. So the right type of stress can give you a specific response, hopefully a favorable response. Um, so what we're talking about here is applying the right type of stress, the right type of muscle tension to be able to elicit growth. Now, magnitude, let's talk about what this looks like in the gym. Like, so, okay. I want magnitude, I wanna, I wanna have uh, the, the right amount of, of muscle tension here. The simple layman's way of thinking about this can be heavy. So when I say heavy, what I'm talking about is loads that are 80% or higher. That's like top end strength stuff, okay? That's pretty simple. All you guys are CrossFitters, you understand like, yeah, heavier is better, right? That's how we kind of track performance. Faster and heavier means you're increasing your fitness. So I think we're all familiar with that. But there are some downsides to always going heavy and there is a shelf life there. You know, if you always do the same thing, you're gonna hit a point where you're just gonna stop adapting. So you can avoid plateaus and in a lot of cases, who had an injury here? Yeah, we're talking about injuries. Like this is another common theme. Load is associated with injury. You're constantly loading the same way, the same type of load. Eventually you might end up with a plateau, but a lot of cases we see due to the repetitiveness of movements, breakdown. My shoulder hurts, my back hurts, my knee hurts. Fair enough. Here are some ways you can get around that stuff without just putting more weight on the bar to allow those mechanosensors to, to freak out so you can adapt. You can look at different types of loading. So when I say loading, most of you guys think, okay, put another 45 on the bar, that's great. But there's all different types of loading you can give yourself, including things like variable resistance. So that's where the resistance is changing. And an easy way to do that, a couple different ways, and there are lots of different ways, is like bands. Right? If you take a band and let's say you attach it to like a barbell and Kevin's doing a bench press, and I know he does this all the time, 
is uh, the neat thing about attaching a bar, a band to a barbell is that at your weakest mechanical advantage here, where, where you're at the bottom of the movement, you have the least amount of tension on the band. And as you gain a mechanical advantage through the concentric or positive portion of the movement where the muscle is shortening, now the amount of resistance increases. So you're able to achieve a peak muscle tension without just putting more weight on the bar. That's also allowing you a little bit more safety because at the weakest position, you're often orthopedically compromised the most. Um, so there's one way. Another way you could do it is with the use of chains. So if you think about something like a back squat, right? Um, in a back squat, if you hang chains from a bar in a back squat, you'll have the most around, amount of resistance at the top. That's where you have the strongest mechanical advantage. And as you go down, those chains start to pile up, the weight's becoming lighter. So we're not just putting more weight on the bar. And the fact that it's changing allows a neurological response where you're able to achieve a peak muscle tension, unlike just using a straight weight. That's just one example of that. There's lots of different examples. We're gonna show you uh, them throughout the course of the weekend. Another one we're gonna talk about is called overload eccentrics. So there are two phases of movement when we're, when we're performing work. Usually there's one phase where the muscle is lengthening, right? Where it's getting longer. And we can call that the negative or the down uh, portion of a movement. So on a bench press, that would be as you're bringing the weight down, your muscles are lengthening. Your tricep is lengthening, your pec is lengthening, right? And as you come up through what we call the concentric portion, when you're winning, right? When you're beating the weight, that means the muscle is shortening. Now, the neat thing here is with overload eccentrics, what we're gonna do is we're gonna lower more weight than we can press up. So if I was doing something like a bench press, that might look like me standing over my partner and pressing down on the bar on the way down, even though I know they can't lift it up and then they can press it up on their own, or it can even be something like a forced rep. And a forced rep is where you actually help somebody get the weight up. So let's say, uh, let's take you here for a second, Cooper. What's your, what's your best bench press? Okay, so Cooper's best bench press is 330. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put 400 pounds on his bar and he's gonna lower it down, right, as slow as he can. And then once it gets to the bottom, I'm gonna put my hands on the bar and I'm gonna help him lift it up. Now he's getting exposure to a type of loading he would no longer be able to achieve on his own because I'm helping him with the weight, but he's still getting the mechanism, the, the, the connection between those mechanical sensors in the brain to be able to think, holy shit, that's different. That's a great catalyst to growth. We'll kind of practice that a little bit today and show you different movements you can utilize that specific temp uh, template with. Now, when, uh, when I say loading, most of you guys think loading as lifting. But that's not always the case. In fact, very seldomly, in CrossFit at least, do we use things called isometrics. So we're different talking about different phases of movement. Isometrics are a great way to manipulate mechanosensors. What an isometric is, is, it's not a concentric or an eccentric, but it's holding still and just contracting in a fixed position. So we can do this in a lot of different ways, not just doing like maximum effort isometrics, but even complexing or putting together movements that are dynamic, right? Where we're moving the weight combined with movements that are static where we're just holding still. So that could look like something like this. I know I use bench press a lot, but you guys all wanna get bigger tits. So, in a bench press, let's say I have you do something like 12 heavy bench press. That's creating a neurological response where you're starting to recruit motor units. These are things that uh, signal to the muscle contract and it'll tell you based on the weight how many motor units you need to contract. So you can touch a heavy weight and then you can go immediately from a heavy weight into an isometric. Well, let's say we go to a cable column or we can just have you flex where you're gonna hold still contracting your pecs for like 30 seconds. That's one way to manipulate tension by integrating dynamic movement with static movement, okay? Um, those are more concept things, uh, or complex things, right? I think, I think those, from a coaching standpoint, are advanced techniques. Here's something that's not so advanced. Different movements. We're good at what we do and we're good at what we do. Well, we're good at what we do and we do what we're good at, okay? And not only do we get comfortable training the way that we train, but you know, due to the repetitiveness of a lot of movements, we start to incur things like muscle imbalances 
and we neglect the fact that new range of motion is often weak range of motion, and by changing something as simple as a grip, right? Um, so let's talk about, uh, where are my crossfitters at? Raise your hand, everybody's a crossfitter, right? When you do pull-ups, show me what your pull-up grip look, looks like. Just put your hands up. Yeah, everyone's like a little bit outside shoulder width, right? You know, imagine if you changed nothing and all you did was this. All you did was go wider. That's enough to change the mechanical loading and the mechanical tension to be able to get a sponsor. When you do the pull-ups, what kind of grip are you using? You said how wide, what does the grip look like? Is it like this? What about this? How often in CrossFit do you see people using a, an, an overhand grip versus say something like a supinated grip, right, where the palms are up? Just changing the grip completely works the arm in an entirely different way. You're no longer working the outer head and the long head of the bicep, now you're on the inner head. And just doing that alone without changing the loading, without changing the reps can be enough to, to get a response. And then finally, like the planes of movement, the ranges of motion. So. Um, if we think about things like, you know, oftentimes, and I know we're not speaking to the bodybuilders here, but in CrossFit, I was talking about the repetitiveness. If we're doing a push up, if we're doing a bench press, it's always in this plane. Very rarely do we do something like an incline bench press. Very rarely do we do something like a decline bench press. So by playing around with different movements, different planes, ranges of motion, this can be enough just to kind of really get the body to, 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 to get a response. And you didn't have to train any harder. You didn't have to put more weight on the bar. You didn't have to do more volume. All you did was you rotated the exercises. If you go to a club gym, maybe that means going to a different machine. You can go to three different lap machines and have three completely different mechanisms happening because these things are very fine. These sensors are really highly, highly sensitive to be able to notice even the smallest difference there, okay? And uh, when we're talking about the range of motion, this is where, and we'll practice this a little bit today, that I know that we talk about range of motion in CrossFit, like there's the, the range of motion nerds. Like, full range of motion, guys, that's cool. That's great, do the full range of motion, especially if you're calculating your workout or trying to compare things totally. But very often do we on purpose truncate a range of motion in our training, and that can be a huge advantage. How much more weight can you rack pull versus deadlift, Jason? A lot more weight, right? So you can manipulate the mechanical tension by like, hey, you know what? I'm just not gonna go all the way to the ground. I'm gonna stay in a better mechanical advantage so I can put more weight on the bar and do it safely. Or uh, we're gonna show you some things today like double contraction sets. So a double contraction set is where you do something like a half rep into a full rep. Now you're able to accumulate more volume by truncating the range of motion. Um, so re really kind of interesting stuff that I want to just kind of expand your mind. And I know we're so conditioned to think about training as a score, right? Well, how fast was it or how heavy was it? And that's fine. You should look at that, especially if you're tracking fitness. But what we're doing is we're shifting our perspective. We're not necessarily concerned so much with the weight or how fast you can do it. We're concerned with taking the muscle to a specific state so that it can adapt. It's not about the result of the, the, you know, the, the bottom line of how much power output you had. It's about creating the right training effect. And now what's cool about that is like, holy shit, now the pressure's off. I don't have to worry about how fast I went. All I got to do is make sure I can take that muscle to failure or expose it to something different so that I can respond. I know mentally, Jason was talking about this, it's just a nice break sometimes um, from that. Okay, cool. So muscle tension, really neat stuff. Next one we're gonna talk about, and this is a very complex mechanism, is called metabolic stress. You guys have all heard that term metabolic before. We'll talk about kind of what that means in the context of hypertrophy, and also we'll talk about what it means in the context of CrossFit. Um, but metabolic stress refers to the acute hypoxia or lack of oxygen that can occur within muscles when we're taking it to a certain level of stress. What happens is that when muscles contract, it's a chemical conversion happening in the muscle. Remember we talked about electrical, the chemical back to electrical. Those M lines and those Z lines, the myosin and actin filaments are actually reacting to a chemical conversion that creates a molecule called ATP. And that is adenosine triphosphate. That's what allows muscles to, to contract and do work, okay? Now, every time this chemical conversion takes place, that's good, but there are byproducts or metabolites that start to occur when those 
chemical conversions take place. And they can build up and actually, not only due to the, the amount of oxygen, the mitochondria in the, in the muscle are eating up, but they can build up and actually create an oxygen deficit where muscles get a lot of buildup of these metabolites. And that can be seen through a lot of different, different ways. The, the largest way you can see something like metabolic stress occurring is cellular swelling. And what's happening during metabolic stress is that as those metabolites start to build up more and more, there's actually more and more fluid going into the cell. So that is intercellular swelling and also around the cell, which is intracellular swelling. Now, let's go back to that movie, Pumping Iron. What's the most famous line in that movie? Like an orgasm. What'd you say? Like an orgasm. I'm always coming. <laughs> They're talking about the pump. They're talking about the pump. Like, oh, the pump. It feels, it feels like you're coming. You love the pump, right? Your muscles, your skin gets so tight and all this stuff. And again, this is bro science meets real science, right? When you say like, oh, dude, you're looking vascular. My muscles are feeling full. You're getting pumped out. This is the process that's taking place inside the muscle, right? This is why it's happening. It's because of the metabolic stress. And the training factors that, um, that, that correlate with this, we'll talk about that in a second, but this is actually a really complex process, and we were talking with Brad a little bit about some of the enzymatic exchange that take place. Cellular swelling creates an anabolic response. We don't exactly know why. We don't understand why. It, we, uh, the hunch is it has something to do with a chemical release. Uh, and if you guys have ever heard of uh, occlusion training, have you guys ever seen that before? Occlusion training is a way to elicit metabolic stress a little bit more effectively by actually like cinching off muscles. So you see these guys that are like got these cuffs on their quads or cuffs on their biceps. The reason why they're trying to do that is they're trying to achieve a lot of metabolic stress because that chemical response sends an anabolic signal throughout the whole body, right? So it's a way to kind of manipulate your body's internal chemistry to be able to grow. Having said that, I don't recommend you guys start doing occlusion training right now because it's way simpler than that. All you need to do is do lighter weight at higher reps to failure. Simple, right? You take something like, you know, 40 to 60% of a one rep max. You do a rep range that can be anywhere from 10, 30, even 50 repetitions. And you keep doing it until you get to failure. Now, usually when you get to failure, what does it kind of feel like when you're doing light reps at a high, at a high weight? Describe the feeling of the muscles. Burns. burns, right? Why does it burn? Because there's a buildup. There's a buildup of hydrogen. There's a buildup of lactate because those metabolites are starting to continue to build every time there's a muscle contraction. And that burning signals the lack of oxygen. So that is a subjective measure, meaning I can't, I can't count it under a microscope, but you can feel it. Right? You can feel when your muscles are burning, that's eliciting metabolic stress. Same thing with like the pump or the muscle fullness. You know, you can go to somebody in a workout, and you can actually feel their muscle and tell if they're starting to get some metabolic stress if they're not. If they're full, if their veins are popping out, that means that's probably occurring well. If they're flat, that means that one or two things are happening. Maybe we're not creating enough intensity to get the metabolic stress, or that can even be something like a nutritional issue. Muscles feed on glycogen. If you are at a glycolytic deficit, if you've burned out all your muscle glycogen, you didn't have enough carbs that day, or if you're working at a caloric deficit, right, that can cause the muscles to go flat where they're not going to fill up as much. They're not going to hold on to that fluid quite so well. Um, so all that's with, with metabolic stress. Now let me show you some of the different ways that we can do this. Let's start with the CrossFit workouts. I like kind of comparing this stuff to CrossFit. You know, every time we do a workout, it's usually for speed or for load. But you know, if you wanted to create a lot of metabolic stress in a CrossFit workout, it can be really simple. You can be like, you know what, instead of gaming the workout, instead of partitioning things out, I'm gonna do each set where I go to absolute failure, right? Where you're just gonna take the muscle to total failure. Maybe you need to rest a little longer before your next set or the next time you get on the bar, or whatever it might be, but you can actually take a muscle to complete failure. One way that we love to, to get a lot of metabolic stress is by using light weights and also by using things like bands. Bands are amazing. Uh, all, we talked about the variable resistance of bands, but it's a really light type of load. You can do really high repetitions. And if I say, hey, you know what, Cooper, today you're gonna finish with 300 hammer curls and 300 tricep extensions on the band, his arms are gonna be blown up at the end of that. And I didn't need to give him a lot of weight. 
And it's not creating a lot of muscle damage either. either. It's just pushing fluid into the muscle to try to get the chemical response. Um, this is what I really like for, where are my injury people? That's what I really love for injuries. Because we take away the weight, but you still have a muscle building response. Right? So, you know, if I, if I say, hey, you know, oh, your shoulder's messed up, that's cool. Cam does this all the time. She did this for her shoulder rehab, where she would just take a super light weight, and with a single arm, she would just press it to failure. You know, she'd get to 20 to 30 reps. By the time she gets to 30, her arms are shaking, right? There's probably some crazy mechanical loading going on there as those motor units try to pull in. But, um, but that's a great way to kind of get around stuff. And one of the ideas of this is varying the training to the point where you can build muscle and fortify yourself, but also make the training a sustainable thing. We all love training hard and going intense. That's awesome. But what's going to allow you to train hard for a long period of time is doing it smart and avoiding the plateaus and avoiding the injuries and common breakdown. This can be a really good strategy for doing that. Okay? And we'll show you that a lot of that stuff today in the form of prehab when we're doing movement prep. Where we'll do some higher rep stuff just to push some blood into muscles, but it's also great for working on weaknesses or working uh, to fix an injury. All right, so there we go, metabolic stress. Last one. You're probably very familiar with this. We call this muscle damage. I talked a little bit about this in the... Uh, in the anatomy portion, where we were referring to the, the damage that occurs to the sarcolemma of the muscle fibers, or the damage that occurs to the myosin and actin bonds of those myofilaments. Um, muscle damage refers to large micro tears that occur in the sarcolemma that occur in the, myo, in the myofilaments. And when muscle damage occurs, this is very much a balancing act where you don't want to have too much muscle damage and you certainly want to have enough to get a healing response. When the muscle damage heals and we talk about thickening, thickening or bulking of, of muscle fibers, this is where we actually see the growth. They heal, they remodel, but muscles want to survive, your body wants to survive, so when it remodels, it remodels thicker to be able to handle that stress. You're like, oh shit, you're gonna ask me to do this? Well, cool, I'm gonna have to get a little bit more fortified to be able to handle that. And that's not even just within the muscle fiber, that also occurs towards the end of the epimecium, we're talking about those turns into tendon, you can get increased tendinal thickness too through the, the damage we're speaking of, okay? Um, so those are both important. That's why, uh, you know, guys who take like a lot of steroids and get really big, really strong, really fast, often suffer tendon tears because their muscles have adapted faster than their tendons have been able to, to thicken. Um, okay, so muscle damage, how does this occur? The first thing we're gonna see here, the most common training factor we'll talk about is eccentrics. And that is, again, the negative portion of, of movement where muscles are lengthening. Now, why is that so good for occurring, uh, uh, eliciting muscle damage? Well, you're actually contracting, right? When you're controlling a weight, you're actually contracting against that lengthening. You're resisting it. And that resisting is what's gonna create the damage in the sarcolemma and the myosin and actin bonds that's gonna help you heal and remodel thicker. So the use and, and the proper use of the right volume of eccentrics, the right amount of eccentrics is really important. And what we're gonna do a lot of today is practice that. We're gonna practice moving slow and moving controlled. And there are so many different ways you can put this stuff together. Again, general adaptation syndrome. Different is probably better. If you normally do it one way, try it a different way. You know, today we're gonna teach you things with three second negatives. Yesterday, Jason did a workout that had 80 seconds of negatives, where he, he was doing a, a press and he spent 10 seconds holding four inches down, 10 seconds holding eight inches down, 10 seconds holding 16 inches down, and then all the way back up again, right? That was just a single repetition. But again, it, it was different. So when we're talking about eccentrics, anywhere from three to 10 seconds long, lengthening muscles is gonna be the sweet spot most of the time. You can kind of vary and stray uh, around that. The loading is important too, because if you're going to take a muscle to failure based on the number of repetitions, that's going to kind of dictate the load. So if I'm going to do something where, let's say, I'm going to do three reps with a three second negative, what does that usually mean about the load? Is it going to be heavier or lighter? Probably heavier if I'm going to try to get it to the point where the muscle is not accustomed, where the muscle is like, yeah, I got this. We don't want to do it. We want you to get to the point where like, I don't know if I can do this. That's a good subjective marker for knowing if you're hitting the sweet spot. Sorry. Um, another thing you can do, right? So we were talking about the repetitions of the loading. If we're doing something like, uh, you know, 64 total repetitions in a single exercise, what does that probably mean about the loading? Heavier or lighter? 
probably lighter because it's a higher volume. And this is such a balancing act because muscle damage is good, but too much muscle damage is catabolic. Anabolic puts your body in a state where it wants to grow, wants to get bigger, okay? Catabolic is the opposite, it's muscle wasting. So if you create too much muscle damage, the survival mechanism in your muscles actually starts to shut down just to protect itself, and you can actually become catabolic or start to shrink, get smaller, we don't want that. Now, how do you know if it's too much or not enough? What do you think? When you do a workout and you're like, how much muscle damage do I do? What's something you might feel in the future? Soreness, right? And if this is a kind of a common acronym, delayed onset muscle soreness. Some people call it, it's a phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon, okay? It, it's pretty simple, we know what's going on. You do damage to your muscles. There are all these healing factors that push fluid. That's where you get inflammation. Inflammation is good. That's what allows you to heal and remodel. So it's not like you should be slamming anti-inflammatories if you're a little bit sore. But you have to ask yourself the question, how much is too much, how much is not enough? Delayed onset muscle soreness is the type of soreness you might feel 24, maybe 48 hours later. That's normal. If you get a little bit sore after your training, that tells you, hey, I've done some muscle damage. But if you can't move for a week, or like Brad was saying the other day, if you leave a training session and you can't lift your arms over your head, that's probably too much, okay? And this is very individualistic. It's contextual based on the athlete's training state, right? How long have they been training for? How trained are they currently? Based on their genetics, based on their age. Um, but this is, again, is something that you can use this as a marker. If you're never feeling sore from a training session, what does that tell you? <laughs> Go fucking harder. Go harder, right? Or if you're like, you can't, like, we, you know, we did leg day. You're like, ah, I, can't, I did leg day. I can't do leg day for another two weeks. That's probably too much leg day, right? So be responsible. A month, take a month off, right? Um, these are just kind of things you want to be thinking about to maximize this stuff. All of these mechanisms are just for you to optimize your training with the specific goal of muscle hypertrophy, with the specific goal of increasing your musculature. You know, when you hypertrophy, the, the, the fibers get thicker. You don't, you don't produce more fibers. You have as many muscle fibers as you're ever gonna have, but those muscle fibers can grow, they can get larger, they can get thicker, and these are the major mechanisms that correlate with them. Questions on any of this stuff? Yeah. So I'm not sure where it fits in, if it's specific related to hypertrophy, but uh, I've seen some stuff like John Wallborn and you know, Cam, I think he's just like my power dot. Yep. Anywhere that plays into maybe just helping you recover faster or you know, maybe getting to more contractile potential. Totally. Um, so Cooper's question was about uh, electric stim. Okay, and this is like, you've seen these stim units. My wife Cam uses one called the Power Dot. There's also another one out there, the Compax or the Mark Pro. A lot of people use that type of stuff with regard to muscle recovery, because what you do is you put an electric diode on a muscle, maybe one that's sore, maybe you have an injury, and it lightly pulses the muscle to start to push fluid in it, just to get some of those healing factors to move in and move out. Most, most of recovery revolves around a basic concept of moving blood in and moving blood out, okay? That's a recovery standpoint. But from a performance standpoint, if you were to take that same stim unit, and let's say you jacked it up, Right? You go on the max level and you start to, you're doing squats and you have your quads contracting really hard. What that can do is that can activate motor units so that when you are squatting, you're recruiting more muscle, potentially. I would call that a very advanced concept compared to simple things like, hey, go heavy, change the movements and the bars, make sure you're taking muscles to failure, make sure you're using some eccentrics. I think these probably have the most compelling effect on that, but if you get to the point where you're like, hey, I'm just not adapting anymore and I've done it all, that's where you see like it's a very advanced technique, okay? Um, but yeah, certainly something. I know people like to major in the minors a lot, right? Like uh, they wanna go right to the finer details before they get the big pieces. Those finer details are cool. And I think by kind of understanding where they may fall in the science, that's neat. Um, but I would encourage you guys, especially starting this, just kind of like stick with the basics first, okay? Anything else? Yes. <clears throat> So I think what's actually causing you to be sore is the buildup of fluids, right? So the, those healing factors that, that's accumulating, like, hey, I'm feeling a little bit inflamed. I think that's actually where the soreness comes from. You can alleviate the soreness by flushing it out. So you can flush it out like Cooper was saying, like, hey, use an electric stim. You can do it on a bike. Um, there are lots of different ways to do it. One thing I will say, though, is like, you want to be a little sore. 
Um, and there's some really interesting studies there about the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So that's something like Aleve, Tylenol, um, where like if you start pounding that stuff before or after your workout, it inhibits muscle growth because you're inhibiting that natural inflammatory response that's gonna allow you to heal and remodel. Uh, same thing with like, you know, we talk about our CBD, like we take CBD uh, as recovery after our training, helps for sleep, helps reduce inflammation, but I tell people if you're gonna use it, don't use it until a few hours after that training session. Allow yourself to be a little sore first before you start pounding that, just so you can get the response you're looking for. That's a good question. Was there another one out here? Yes. So, um, what was your name again? Shannon. Okay, so Shannon's talking about potentiation, the recruitment of muscle, uh, starting to get certain things fired up or involved in the movement. When we use things like muscle activation, we'll usually use it on the front end of workouts in the form of, we call it prehab. So prehab is, it's rehabilitation, but it's done before you get the injury. It's preventative to help you get the injury. And the reason why we use it specifically is that we wanna make sure that when you're moving, you're using the right muscles the way they should and that they're warm. So let's say for instance, when we're, when we're uh, today we're gonna to start off, we're gonna do some bench press today. Yay, right? Kevin's happy. Um, when we start with bench press, our prehab is gonna involve a lot of scapular work to be able to make sure that we're putting the muscle into a proper position so that it can press safely. There's a great reason for it, okay? Very few people will have a hard time recruiting muscle if we're creating a lot of muscle tension, right? So if there's a lot of weight on the bar, you're gonna recruit a lot of muscle. If, when you create metabolic stress, what happens is those motor units, as they start to fatigue, they actually burn out and pull motor units in. So it's gonna be very hard not to recruit muscle fibers if you're training close to failure. Does that make sense? That was a really good question. It's a little bit more advanced, but the layman's terms is like, how do I get more muscle involved? Or how do I get the right muscle involved, okay? Even with regard to, and we'll talk a little bit today, is like some muscles are hard to recruit. Um, for instance, the lat, and Jason and I were talking about this uh, when we were at the gym. The lat is really a finesse muscle. A lot of people, when they do something like a pull-up, they'll do a pull-up and they'll pull like this. I'm not saying they're not using their lat, but they're actually using more of their arm than their lat. So we're gonna talk about specific ways to do movement to maximize recruitment of what we're working on. And that might be simple things like using straps sometimes. Uh, in the case of the lat, like taking your, pinky, your fingers off the bar, pulling through the pinky, or just thinking about instead of bending the elbow so much, just pushing with the elbows. That can kind of change the level of recruiting muscles, and that's how you're doing it. How you do exercises, is probably more important than the specific exercise you're doing, right? Because I can have you do a bunch of pull-ups and you might not really be using your lats. Or I can have you do one exercise where whatever it is, if we're getting into it, that's awesome. Um, so it's a very important piece is like how you're doing it. A little bit different than the form and technique we talk about in CrossFit. The form and technique we're using in CrossFit is usually to maximize performance or reduce the risk of injury. When we're speaking about muscle hypertrophy, really it's about like recruiting the right amount of muscle for what we're, we're focusing on. And sometimes that might not be the most efficient way to move. Um, you know, like you're doing something where you're purposely putting yourself in a deficit. For instance, today we're going to do sissy squats. Have you guys ever heard or seen a sissy squat before? It's a substitute for a hack squat machine. It's a way for you to squat using your quads more than your hamstrings and your glutes. No, it's not more efficient for athletic performance, but it is a great way to develop quads to get a quad sweep or just bigger legs in general. Um, okay, cool. Well, let's move on from here. I'm gonna erase this stuff. What's going on out there, Andrew? Let me check our time here. Yeah, Perfect, all right. Oh, we're doing great. So. Now, I'm gonna quiz you guys a little bit and I'm gonna reveal what our, first, uh, what our first workout's gonna be. Yay, everyone wants to train here. Came here to learn and get bigger, right? All right. So, a couple of years ago, I had, I had major back problems, really bad disc issues. The three levels of disc in my back were completely torn. I was losing feeling in my legs. I had to get back surgery. It sucked. I was on the couch for two weeks. Cami needed to help me pee, pull my pants down because I couldn't even move. It was the best, right? That's how you know who your real friends are. When you, make, when, you, when you make them hold your ding dong, then they know who your real friends are. So you're next, Jason. So 
so I'm lying on the couch and I'm totally devastated. I'm like, God, I just can't wait till I can stand again. I can't wait till I can walk again. I can't wait till I can train again. And when I get the opportunity to be able to train again, I want, I'm going I'm to do it with purpose. I'm going to do it on purpose with purpose. And I want a goal. And I was thinking, well, what could I do? What do I want to compete at? Well, CrossFit. Eh, CrossFit's probably not a great idea. I'll probably just end up fucking my back up again if I do that. So that's out. Powerlifting, strongman. Nah, that's kind of a recipe of disaster for the spine. And I thought, hypertrophy. Oh, wait, I think... I think I could hit hypertrophy without going as fast as I can, without going as heavy as I can, I can still get muscle hypertrophy. And this is kind of where all this stuff started, just researching hypertrophy, looking about different ways to do things and understanding how to kind of blend it with functional fitness and CrossFit. And I came across this guy named Vince Gironda. Has anybody ever heard of Vince Gironda before? Okay, if you don't, you got two guys right here, they heard me talk about it before. Um, look him up when you get back home. He's a really cool guy, he's dead unfortunately, but he is a legend of the training industry before our time in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, even a little bit of the 80s, this guy was one of the foremost experts on bodybuilding and muscle hypertrophy. And he had some really innovative ideas. The first thing he had had nothing to do with training was eating a ketogenic diet. So he's the author, and this was like in the 60s, he had the steak and eggs diet. You wanna be a bodybuilder, you can eat steak and eggs. He was adamantly opposed to steroids. So steak and eggs, train the right way, you'll never need any steroids. So there was one cool thing he did. Another cool thing he did was he came up with a bunch of different programs that were pretty unique to the bodybuilding world. In bodybuilding, a lot of times you'll see bodybuilders train where they train just an individual muscle group. So hey, today is lat and, uh, lat and bicep day, chest and tri, legs day, so on and so forth. What he did was pretty interesting and really advantageous for a natural athlete was he combined his training days to upper and lower. And the reason for that was to recruit as much musculature as possible in a training session so that you could get a natural hormonal response. And when I say hormones, I'm talking about natural growth factors that you all secrete. Growth hormone, testosterone, thyroid function, all these things can be elicited by systemic loading and recruiting a lot of muscle and creating a lot of stress in your training programs. So he was smart enough to know like, hey, bicep curls are not gonna cure metabolic disease or get you bigger, but if we do maybe some, some things where there's a lot of muscle, upper and lower happening, that's really cool. What I did was I took one of his templates and I, uh, Andrew and I did this both together, is we adapted it for CrossFit. We took the movements that were just kind of like isolation movements and we thought, well, well what can we still kind of do to preserve functional fitness, but still tap into some of the things he was doing. So here's a program. You ready for it? It's pretty cool. It's called the 8x8 program. And what that means is eight sets of eight reps. So it gives you a total of 64 repetitions. So when you're talking about like uh, muscle tension, certainly a good amount of volume and duration in there where there's a, lot, there's a lot of time spent loading the muscle. What I liked about this program coming off of back surgery is that it wasn't heavy. In fact, it was 40% of your one rep max. So if I say, we're only gonna lift 40%. What does that probably mean for some of the other training factors? Because 40% is not a lot, right? And if you have to create a, a good amount of stress in your body, that means for that 40% to be potent enough to get a response, I'm gonna have to have enough volume. So we're gonna do, today we're gonna do, six different movements. Okay, and that's a good amount of, of, of volume in there. With the weight lighter, if I'm doing it eight sets of eight reps, how long do you think I should rest between my sets? Really long or really short? Probably really short, so with that 40%, we're only doing 30 seconds rest. Okay, so tell me, based on the mechanisms we highlighted, what is the eight reps at 40% with 30 seconds rest, which mechanism is that gonna tap into the most? Muscle tension, metabolic stress, or damage? Metabolic stress, yeah, like there's not enough, there's not enough rest to fully recover, which means that there's a compounding effect across these sets. So when you do these sets, your first set might be really fucking easy. You'll be like, oh, 40%, eight reps, no problem. Put more weight on the bar, don't do that, don't do that. Because the goal here is to get very close to failure by sets six, 
seven, and eight. I want you to be scared that you can't do it by set six, seven, and eight. Here's the real kicker and the potency in this program. Every rep will have a three second negative. Okay? So, again, if we're using the bench press or the pull up as an example, we're taking 40%, but every rep we're gonna count Mississippi, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi press. Okay? We'll do that for eight reps total. And then you'll have 30 seconds rest, and you do that eight times through each exercise over the course of today. We're just gonna do six different movements. And here are the movements we're gonna do. And again, the three second negative, what are we trying to tap into with the negative here? What is that giving us? Is it giving us metabolic stress? Not so much. Muscle tension? Eh, what about this one? Yeah, there's a lot of muscle damage occurring. So you should ex expect, like, you, like I said, don't underestimate this stuff, especially if you've never done it before. You're gonna be sore even with a light weight. Uh, and that's what I really love about like, the context of hypertrophy within working around injuries or working weaknesses is like you can still get a really good response by being strategic about it. So often are we just like trying to go as fast as we can, control things. Controlled movement garners more growth, right? That's just, that, that's just the nuts and bolts of it, okay? Um, now, finally, let's go over the movement. So first one we're gonna do is a bench press. That'll be nice and simple. You're probably all familiar with that. Second movement's gonna be a wide grip pull up. And Andrew's gonna show you that one. He'll go through each one of these with you and go over like what the scales are and, and how to do them. But the wide grip pull up you're gonna do today is probably actually gonna be a jumping pull up, which is like the worst thing I've ever done. You know, like, I think specifically in our level one, we go, don't ever do jumping pull ups with the negative. It's gonna give you rhabdo. I've never seen somebody get rhabdo doing jumping pull up negative. I have seen them get rhabdo doing too many GHDs or 10,000 pull ups. But uh, don't, don't be so afraid of that. But you will be a little bit sore. Okay, next one, Arnold press. So the Arnold press is really similar to a traditional press. You guys may see with a barbell, even with a dumbbell. The difference is with the Arnold press, you add a little bit of range of motion. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn your palms in and bring the weight a little bit lower so that there's now additional recruitment of the pec and of the front delt, even the bicep when you're doing the movement. Changing the movement changes the muscle tension, right? So, you know, if you're like, yeah, I can, I can press 50s all day. If I ask you to do like a legitimate Arnold press, you might be completely handcuffed at 35 pounds. That's fine, that's what we want. New range of motions, weak range of motion. New movement, you're just not gonna be as used to it or, or as good at it. Okay, next one, sissy squat. So sissy squat, again, very traditional to the regular squat, except what we're gonna do, and this is all adapted kind of for the CrossFit functional gym space, is we're gonna wrap a band around the bar, strap it behind your knees, so that you can balance yourself and stay completely upright as you allow yourself to kind of squat in a very quad dominant type of way while you're holding a kettlebell. Now, all of these things, how would you classify them? Are they isolation movements? No, there's like multiple joints working, uh, multiple muscle groups. It's pretty athletic movements you probably see in sport and in life, right? So this is where we've tried to preserve the functionality and the idea of like, hey, we still want you to be able to move and be athletic because we're giving you compound stuff, okay? At the very end, in the minority, is where we put isolation movements. So I'm gonna keep it simple today because we're all, we're all bros and brosafinas who like to like, you know, smash, smash iron. Um, we're gonna do bicep and triceps, but we're gonna pick some different movements maybe you haven't done before. So the first bicep movement you guys are gonna do is called a Zotsman curl, which is a really cool, funky kind of movement. Uh, and we'll show you different variations of it, but the Zotsman curl is up with dumbbells. And what it is, is not only does it require a little bit of coordination, but, uh, but you're gonna alternate grips. So as one arm comes up, you're gonna have your palm facing up. And then at the top of the movement, you're gonna turn your palm down and then bring the opposite one up. So it'll kind of look like this. And Andrew will kind of describe to you how it goes. Now the reason for that is because now instead of just training one head of the bicep, you're training all heads of the bicep in a single movement. Another way you can do that was both arms, where you come up, palms facing up, and down, palms facing down. But again, if you've ever done curls, you've probably never done them that way, at least not frequently. So there's the idea of like getting it different and changing the mechanism. And then finally, just an old traditional skull crusher. Uh-oh. You didn't like those. <laughs> 
Yeah. So you've got two different heads of your, bi uh, of, your, of your tricep. There's the long head. The long head is stuff you work, like if you do a press down or a dip or a bench press, you're working the long head. As soon as you bring the weight overhead and something like a skull crusher, now you're hitting a different head. So the idea is like to spread the love around a little bit more with movement variety. And again, of all these things, we know it's not functional. We know you're not gonna cure metabolic disease with Zotzman curls and skull crushers. That's why 75% of what you're doing is functional stuff, okay? So any questions on, on that? All right, cool. So here's what I want to do. You guys can, Kevin, is there a good place where they could break their chairs down? Okay, you can put them on the wall over here. Take a little break, grab a drink of water, put on your workout gear if you need to. These are the movements we're doing. And Andrew is going to, uh, Andrew's going to start warming you up and taking you through the workout. Before we go, is there anyone here who can't do one of these movements outside the scope of scaling. I know, Kevin, we're gonna have to have you do handstand push-ups instead of sissy squats. Now, anyone who was injured can't do one of these things? All right, cool. Go ahead and break, take five minutes, and Andrew's gonna kick you guys off. <laughs> 